I'm really moved at that you all make an effort uh, in such a chilly night. I actually just got back from Asia and it was snowing there, uh, particularly in Shanghai area. Um, so I actually kind of enjoy this kind of chilly weather. Uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, the whole day long, I've been struggling with the technical issue <laughs> in Korean right now. Uh, my computer was hacked when I was in Asia. Um, since I have a short time and um, I actually, it's a, it's a huge topic, talk about you know, uh, women's role in the making of art uh, in China. Uh, of course, like every aspect of Chinese culture, um, it uh, takes a lot of words to uh, explain. So, and, and it took me uh, a f three, four years to write my PhD dissertation in early 90s, and took me another decade to uh, expand the five times uh, to this book. I actually brought a copy um, because tonight what I'm going to talk, I think was just you know, um, a glimpse of what I have written uh, one and a half decade in the making of this uh, book. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to pass it along. Uh, you know, welcome to take a look. I'm not trying to sell the book, but <laughs> <laughs> you can read the uh, first uh, chapter, the introduction I have made into um, PDF file. Everybody can read it, right? So um, fasten your seatbelt um, within the following 45 minutes and see how much I can cruise through. Um, the uh, working on um, well, women's role in art. Um, the, since I've been thinking about the issue for uh, more than two decades. Um, so as you all know, um, in gender study today, uh, methodologically is quite uh, um, um, sophisticated now. So, uh, but it's still very laid back in, in China. Uh, I, my colleagues in literature and uh, history are uh, so much more advanced. But in our history, uh, my book, uh, Believe or Not, is the first one. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I had gone through peer review, um, uh, I was amazed at how much my colleagues, um, the lacking of uh, uh, sympathy. I mean, they were so excited, but they kept uh, commenting on uh, how come I didn't address this, address that, or address you know, something else. So that also reflects that there's a need. You know, just most people don't know anything about it. So uh, I have been also training my graduate student in the offering seminar. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a sequel of this book uh, called Gender Crossing. Because the more I work on gender issue, this is also where I uh, take a uh, position. As you all know, the Chinese, the yin yang, yang philosophy, right? I don't think uh, uh, male, female, yin and yang are opposite. Um, and as a matter of fact, they are, uh, we call them complementary opposite. They are always together. So uh, for me, the gender issue, only you position yourself, you know, can look at the both sides and the mutual way. Then it will be, you know, uh, meaningful. Um, so, of course, my first book, I try hard to, you know, reclaiming or proclaiming female agency because it's, uh, you know, gender study. But the, the current book I'm working on is more so-called gender crossing about how, you know, men and women mutually <coughs> borrow their, you know, persona and to, for the purpose of self-expression. Um, so the, the, this is the whole concept, you know, so I, I thought I would just uh, spend a couple of minutes explaining it. So in terms of this big topic, uh, you will come across articles or books or, uh, you know, beautiful big catalog. But most of them, I would say 99% deal with so-called, you know, images of the women. So we call, you know, um, you know uh, presentation. So here I have three, uh, four big categories that just reflect my way of thinking. Uh, I think uh, representation is just some very objective material. But when you use the term presentation, uh, that uh, uh, in terms of the gender issue, uh, we're talking about something women more in charge, right, to present the self. Uh, so there's a two kind of different, you know, approach. Or images, again, in, uh, just like a presentation. Uh, and imaging, you know, as a verb, it all has more subjectivity in it. 
So of course, objectivity and subjectivity, we all know um, a lot of writing basically treat the you know, uh, images of women as an object, right? But uh, um, the, my uh, uh, one main approach is try to uncover how uh, intelligent women could be, you know, through adapt oneself into the constructed society or, you know, uh, 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 cult and try to carve out a space for themselves. And, and in many ways, um, in, in China, what a way to express it uh, is from the, the Laozi, one of the most supreme, you know, Taoist way of thinking. In Dao De Jing is a, um, a phrase, say the, um, the most powerful, uh, the supreme power, actually is Yin, and it was manifested through water. Because water look yielding and soft, but you know, it can break a, a, anything you know, through time, it's a little drop. Uh, so this uh, uh, concept of uh, water, so I, you know, I adopted the way of water, as it's very yielding, right? the manifestation of the feminine, the supreme feminine, uh, women, uh, and also the, uh, the way, the female way to get things done is usually not a direct, it's a senior's way. So in China, there's another expression called um, ruling behind the screen, right? Even when women uh, assume the supreme power, they cannot, you know, uh, execute their power directly, usually indirectly. Uh, so there's, there's so much uh, theory that, you know, you can actually uh, apply uh, to the reading of the Chinese art material. Um, next one, please. The recent scholarship, uh, as I mentioned, in literature, in history, um, you know, everybody actually heading to work a very similar, you know, direction. <coughs> but as I say, you know, China still very much left behind. So um, methodologically, when I work on this uh, subject, I try to see women, not just a women painter. I mean, that women painter, the concept is such a cliche, you know, it's been edited out already, right? So even you exhaust all your effort, at most you just recover a very small portion of the history. So uh, it methodologically, rather, I frame it, you know, women's role in various ways. They can be our patrons, tastemaker, interpreter, uh, they can be the creator, collaborator, you know, so the, the, um, the, uh, the role can, you know, uh, change all the time. So all um, we may give this, use this term called uh, as an aviator or uh, uh, mediator, right? Or actually agent, agency. I think it's very, you know, apt for you know, uh, the, um, this uh, concept. So um, as I say, how women, you know, were able to uh, adapt into basic more a Confucian, you know, male-oriented society and can subvert this power and uh, in a very serious way. So I'm going to demonstrate, you know, a few uh, cases. Uh, more books, but uh, like Jay, uh, views from Jay Terrace's, uh, Jay Terrace, um, it's, it's about women painter in the Imperial China from 14th century on. And they came up with, you know, a conference volume. So this is just the, all the English, you know, uh, publication, what you can find. But there are quite a few on um, um, literature and uh, history. Um, more like my um, uh, teacher back to Yale days, uh, this big anthology on women writer. But again, she also took a, you know, um, an approach um, in this anthology, the two big volumes. Um, one part of it was men's writing about women, uh, uh, women uh, women's uh, writing. So that's, uh, you know, it's kind of the interact. It's more, the, I think, uh, uh, among the uh, cultural historian, the most eloquent one probably is uh, Dorsey Kuo, uh, who has written uh, the two books. Other than Teachers of Inner Chambers, there are also uh, Cinderella's Slipper. It's about, you know, those little shoes, uh, foot binding uh, practice in China. Yeah was wonderful, I highly recommend, you enjoyed it. This is the most inspiring, you know, uh, groundbreaking writing. Cinderella's slip, uh, slippery, slippery. Uh, in the quarter, pressure records, you know, along, you know, these kind of uh, thinking. 
in uh, my book. There are five chapters. So today I use my introduction, uh, the concept of palindrome. Um, it's a real object. I will mention in a minute uh, how it was created. And uh, I use palindrome as a um, metaphor to talk about you know, the essence of the uh, Chinese women's approach uh, and, and the, the real spirit, uh, how it manifests through the palindrome. And, but in order to articulate this concept, I utilize you know, art from um, basic from the 4th century all the way to 13th century. But the, uh, the main argument of the book was uh, an enduring paradigm, how it emerged or created uh, in 11th to 13th century China and being followed by the later you know, uh, um, time all the way to the 20th century. So today I will jump all the way to the 20th century. And to, um, within this uh, three uh, century, uh, I try to argue how this new paradigm emerged, right, the most enduring one. I have to contrast it uh, to um, what I call medieval parad paradigm, um, you know, medieval women's uh, practice. So that's all in the introductory part. Then just the song. Song is regarded as the very much uh, classical era uh, in China in terms of, you know, the cultural uh, making. So I group, you know, art in four different ways. One more is can kind of react or uh, echo in, you know, the making of art in medieval China, which is all this monumental scale, excavation of the um, Buddhist um, uh, caves, or the creation of, you know, uh, sculpture, uh, architecture, temple, or even the divine imperial capital. That's the medieval Chinese women's practice. But whereas, you know, in uh, Song, uh, historian more regarded as early uh, modern time, 11th to 13th century, um, right before Marco Polo got to China. So the, the early medieval uh, paradigm is more adapted to gentleman's art into something very refined, mostly the art of writing, uh, manifest through um, literary writing, poetic writing, or calligraphy, uh, or you know the most refined art uh, in Chinese painting. Uh, so that's you know the more kind of pre-modern um, the uh, paradigm. So I will talk about the um, art of writing, or uh, the didactic art. I kind of took a different angle, how women adopted, you know, this is usually created by Confucian scholar to teach women how to obey, right, to codify, you know, the Confucian uh, teaching. But how women took subjective, you know, control to utilize it and to promote oneself through promoting, creating didactic arts, right? So religion is like a very boring subject, right? But actually you see a lot of life in it. And um, then the art of expression, this is probably the most, you know, telling one. How to uh, collaborate with a core painter or, you know, their own writing, uh, their own prose, their own poem, or their own calligraphy that uh, they express uh, themselves. And then, you know, the way of water is the way that I sum up. Um, right, so um, evidences of women's involvement in art uh, can go back to 12, uh, the uh, BCE, uh, the Shang Dynasty. That's the dynasty Chinese have evidences of the written uh, language in oracle bone, also inside um, bronzes. The National Palace Museum in Taipei currently um, is having an exhibition on view. It's about this uh, M, uh, imperial consort. Uh, her name is uh, Fu Hao, means a good woman. Um, she and the, her uh, husband, the, the king, um, the, um, was you know, the most prosperous time of the Shang Dynasty. And she plays a various role. I mean, the excavation was so rich, uh, thousands of um, items. And um, the role includes, because through the records of Oracle Bone, that she has born many children. She was also a shaman and also a female general who, you know, fought uh, for the kingdom. And uh, standing in the, in the um, among the objects um, kind of excavated, again, 
archaeologists most of the men, you know, they just counted how many and you know how it's revised the history. But every single piece I look at that, I see her in there. You see, this is a beautiful JPEG piece, right? Translucent, a pendant, see a crown. It's very elegant, right? You see the, a queen there. Or even a bronze piece, this is called a gu. The lid can lift it up, it's a wine vessel. But you can almost see that she was in armor, right? <laughs> you read into her biography, you see her everywhere. And in this excavation, her bronze mirror, the mirror, you know, the other side is polished. The back was, you know, very ornate, de uh, decorated, sometimes with inscription of, you know, auspicious line or poetic line. So um, it been handheld or been in store. So bronze mirror is more kind of women's, you know, um, an, an item. And then there are hundreds of um, combs carved with beautiful ivory or you know jade and precious material. So when we this is again you know uh, evidence is everywhere and um, when you look closer, um, you tell us a lot about the creator, right? The, uh, even it's just you know this is just buried with her, but uh, you know she is there you know from the art uh, artifacts tell us a lot about you know um, the uh, Fu Hao. And so that's really uh, ancient China. From fourth century on, we have very systematic, you know, uh, evidences uh, to show women's, you know, uh, as a powerful uh, presence in uh, Chinese art history. So this is what I call um, the medieval, you know, um, uh, pattern. Was involved in the excavation, uh, creation of the monumental um, Buddhist cave like this. Um, there's three major ones uh, in China proper, from the northwest, the Yungang, then Dongmen in Luoyang. Luoyang is one of the ancient uh, capital, and then to uh, Dunhuang, the beginning of the Silk Road. Right? So the um, last quarter of the fifth century, we have this called Empress Dowager Wenming. Wenming means a civilization, and uh, she, you know, adapts this male practice. Uh, but she didn't excavate a single cave. Uh, starting from her time, the cave became twin caves. Uh, so she started with, you know, enshrined herself with, you know, her grandson because she was the regent. And then she, you know, glorified her, uh, her family instead of, you know, her husband's uh, family. So this, uh, this idea of twin cave and also proclaim the ruling is under so-called twin sages. So, you know, um, herself and the grandson. Right? Uh, and later, this in the seventh century, was adopted by the most formidable uh, Chinese Empress, uh, Empress Wu. We'll get her in a minute. And again, her follower uh, in the first half of the sixth century, uh, Empress uh, Ning, um, in the capital of the Luoyang, uh, there's records of how many hundred thousand beautiful temples, uh, you know, were created at that time. But the one imperial temple, you know, within the whole complex, right in the middle, is this uh, splendid nine-story pagoda, was created by Empress Daozhou uh, Ling. This is all the excavation from then, and the site, from the excavation and the survey of the site, they were able to calculate the height of it. But just the sheer, you know, records about how splendid it was, was, you know, um, the, uh, just paraphrasing. When this completed, she ascended the, uh, the pagoda with all her subjects, right, the, uh, of the high official. And it was described that, you know, when she uh, reached the top, and you can hear, you know, the door, um, the um, bell rings in the wind, and when she overlooked at the imperial capital, the figure, everybody looked like just an ant, and everything like within her palm. Right? So this is uh, all the whole the description. This is also the era, the Buddhist sculpture has the most beautiful Mona Lisa smile. <laughs> Stretched greatly, you know, on the spiritual, you know, elevation. And this is all created under Empress, you know, uh, Daojiu Ling including uh, this empress possession um, in uh, Longmen central Binyang cave. 
but now uh, was um, you know it was looted in the um, in second half mid century as it entered into the collection of uh, Nelson Atkin Gallery in Kansas City. You can go visit it. Yeah, and on the facing side is the Emperor's Procession. Uh, that, unfortunately, that one also looted, but was severely damaged. So that part was reconstructed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. When you go visit, you can see it there. Uh, but it was really severely damaged. You can see very little. This one is damaged to you see carefully. You know, some parts not quite uh, connected. But it's very beautiful. So, so when I argue about so-called taste maker, these uh, high relief was very unusual for its time. Uh, because it's so fluent, so elegant. In the uh, history recorded that Empress Dowager Ling took special interest to supervise this project, but also she was severely criticized by you know, her high official because she was too extravagant and paid too much attention to her attire, her look. Uh, you know, it's not uh, uh, appropriate uh, for the image of you know, martyr of the kingdom, like right, of the uh, empire. So from this we know, you know the, uh, because uh, compared to similar high relief, this kind of procession, this one was unique. And it was recorded that you know, she made uh, uh, a special uh, tour and investigate you know, uh, the, um, the making of this site. So continue this medieval um, um, uh, paradigm. But the most powerful one was the Empress Wu Zetian. Um, she was on the political arena for half a century and um, the eventually to the degree that she um, uh, created her own dynasty and proclaimed you know, emperor, because I, I know it's redundant in, in English, you're not supposed to call it emperor, right? In China, it's a Huangdi. Uh, and changed the uh, Tang dynasty into Zhou dynasty, uh, her own maiden name. Um, so, when he was, she was still an empress, she excavated this site in the, this original temple with the structure, but collapsed those perishable material. So reveal, you know, this uh, uh, nine-piece uh, ensemble with a Varakana Buddha in the middle. And, uh, uh, and very uh, clearly indicate it's still on the throne of the Varakana Buddha. Uh, Varakana Buddha means Buddha of light, the whole, uh, almighty. She very much identified herself with you know this image and on the base still carved you know inscribed that she took out her personal uh, fund uh, and to patronize the making of it in honor of her own sister uh, ancestor not her husband's <laughs> and but empress wu was huge she she loomed so big that not only her political talent she adopted Buddhism and used Buddhism in such a way that, that she you know, moved the imperial capital from the uh, east, uh, west to the uh, west, uh, to the east. And the, uh, the blueprint for her imperial capital um, is based on the spreading of the Buddhist Dharma, the Buddhist teaching. So she you know, envisioned it. It's not just the center of the Chinese empire, but the center of the world. And um, so like spreading the Buddhist Dharma. In, so there was a really um, detailed uh, description of this divine capital created by Empress Wu. So this is medieval paradigm just tell you, you know, how significant that women, you know, role in Chinese art history. But again, all what I've seen, um, you know, mentioned still barely touched upon. <laughs> People who study Empress Wu will talk about her um, religious advisor or other aspect of the history or literature. And, uh, but the, um, the evidence of the size is everywhere in China. But, but I think just because the topic probably is still too big, uh, but at least you, know, um, you can see it's, it's there. She's also an excellent calligrapher herself, with this uh, flying white uh, uh, style, around for temple, for you know the, um, the the site of the imperial you know uh, sacred mountain, and often she even uh, make it uh, display. The uh, her predecessor is Emperor Taizong, was the most glorified uh, you know um, 
the celebrated emperor in Chinese history. She actually started as a, her, uh, his uh, consort, and then you know become the Taizong's son, Gaozong's uh, uh, empress. This, again, this, all the court intrigues, and um, and she often was so good in utilize the fine art. I mean, in Chinese, uh, um, the um, hierarchy of uh, fine arts is not architecture, uh, sculpture, is calligraphy, and then painting. It's very different from the European uh, tradition. Uh, architecture exists, sculpture exists, but it's more in craftsman's practice. And usually it's supervised by the literati, the educated you know, um, elite. So the, um, the, the system, uh, visual, you know, uh, the making of the visual art, the system, it's very different from European tradition. So um, all the um, sagacious um, ruler all want to involve in calligraphy art. Uh, if at least, you know, to become a collect collector. So Taizong was well known for collecting so-called the prince of Chinese calligraphy, Wang Xizhi, uh, the sage of Chinese calligraphy, you know, a figure in the fourth century. And exhaust every piece into, you know, uh, his imperial collection. And to the degree that before he died on his dying bed, he ordered to have every piece buried with him particularly his most favorite, the most well-known one, called Previous to the Lanting Pavilion. It's an you know, uh, elegant gathering. So the um, Empress Wu you know, continued this uh, uh, practice, continued collecting you know, the sage of Chinese calligraphy, Wang Xizhi's writing. So the family, when they presented last piece owned by the family, and she made a, a public display, and she accepted and then had the courtier copy it, make several copy uh, in the court, and then keep the you know uh, the copied um, uh, pieces, and have the original one remount, you know, re embellished, uh, make it into you know, a perfect condition, and then she returned to the Wang family. So it's an ingenious public display. So they being you know celebrated by the whole em uh, empire, you know, praise. How what a sagacious you know ruling, unlike her predecessor, one bury everything with him, right? She made a public display, you know. The uh, she honored the family and they collected you know the copy into the imperial collection, but he she returned the original one. Uh, so this is a, again this kind of um, is significant because later um, after her, I call it the post Wu Empress Wu era. Because you know, she scared the uh, Confucian scholar to the degree that after her, women you know, were not allowed to be the regent uh, of the empire, even when it's necessary. So I'm going to talk about 11th century. There's a transition. Next one, please. So of course, later uh, Chinese historian in Chinese historiography, she was all painted just one side, you know, complete black, and was condemned in all regard. But interestingly, oh, next one. The, she composed um, an essay and promotes women's didactic arts, also the didactic teaching, uh, and have them printed, you know, and sent over the uh, the empire. And she also promotes a lady uh, in the first century in her, her writing, uh, not not just writing. This lady is called Su Hui. Su Hui creates um, the, something called silk woven palindrome. Chinese called Hui Wen, means a circular writing. And in the fourth century, the story goes that Su Hui, you know, her husband was a point, uh, very much in love. She was from a good family, good looking, and talented. But the husband took in a concubine and was very fond of the concubine. So she's a little bit quick tempered, so was very you know, annoyed. So when the husband was appointed a military position in the far west, uh, she, I invited her to go, she refused. And then because she was annoyed with the husband took in a concubine, right? Uh, so the husband abandoned her, just went on with the concubine. And later she regretted, and and also you know she was really in love with her husband, so she composed a poem uh, called this uh, you know circular writing, and she wove it into you know with a silk into a piece of something splendid. Next one. 
with 840 words. In the middle is the character called Heart, and with five colors of silk. So this is the Chinese circular writing called, you know, Chinese pal palindrome. Different from the European palindrome, uh, European palindrome is, has to be exact reversible, right? And same phrases. In Chinese, the poetry can be read in four character, or by five, by seven. And so you can read from top to bottom and go uh, clockwisely or counterclockwisely. It can, you know, step back one word and still, you know, will make, and so, all together, you can read into 2,000 some different kind of poem. <laughs> so speaking of you know, who the, 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 the genius who created this. So all what she tried to do was, you know, and then she had somebody sent to her uh, husband. So uh, the husband read it and, uh, you know, supposedly, you know, so she also wove her heart into, you know, this palindrome. So the husband was so touched, you know, send away the concubine and send the car to, you know, uh, bring her. So it's a happy reunion. So this is a, a story, so, you know, everybody forgot about it. But Empress Wu took a special interest. She composed an essay and to, you know, uh, celebrate Su Hui's story and praise, uh, you know, Su Hui's husband. Say, you know, this wayward husband eventually, finally, you know, realized that uh, so it's some, um, somebody, you know, uh, deserved to be praised. Um, so this is what I try to uh, bring up, uh, Chinese women. You, you, from the surface, you see all this didactic, you know, uh, moral lesson, right? But in reality, uh, I actually see Su Hui, actually, you know, uh, this is the act of subversion right, as if that she lowered down her position and to please the, the uh, husband with a piece of artwork she created, right. And she probably very much, you know, knew that this is going to, you know, uh, move her husband, you know, to bring him back. Um, so I, I see, you know, the subversive power uh, in the creation of this kind of art. So at the end is, uh, um, in, in Chinese also, um, the history of cultural creation is always have a pattern. Um, you have the, uh, you can almost read it like an allusion, keep, you know, allude back to the history. Um, so now we have a creation of the fourth century, but a recounting by empress who were powerful women in the seventh century, right? And then afterwards, you know, in 11th, 12th century, in this Song Dynasty, a lot of these educated elite, um, Chinese give them a term called literati, wenren, they also adopt this uh, literary genre and start to create it. Uh, many male painters start to illustrate the story. Uh, so the, its origin kind of got forgotten, right? And it becomes just a celebrate, you know, a, a good story. Oh, the, uh, this is a, come back please. It's uh, a, an example I give, you know. Uh, the um, the Western uh, palindrome, but in in Chinese palindrome, you know, it's, it works differently. Um, so you can also pick up and um, read it from the middle, or you know, somewhere you still can come up something. <coughs> but of course, the is also tied to the um, characteristic of a Chinese uh, uh, language. You know, it's very imaginistic. In each character, uh, it has so much. Um, meaning embodied in that, in, uh, in that character. But also grammatically, it's very flexible. Um, so the um, careful chosen of the, the words, you know, it can make all different kind of uh, combination. And that's why I think it's make it, you know, uh, possible. Or I, maybe you can also um, use this way to explain Chinese language is a very kind of, um, not just imaginistic, but also kind of very poetic language. If you learn classical Chinese, you see they, you know, they break all the rule of the, uh, the grammar. <laughs> and uh, of course, it still has its own grammar, but it's just so flexible. And you can move it around and still, you know, be able to express. That's why. So these are all the later illustrations the, um, of the, the story. 
you know, the, uh, and of course, sending the, you know, the carriage and the happy, you know, reunion. Yeah. Excellent. You even found in a lot of archaeological, you know, um, excavation, the mural painting. And this is uh, one of the example, you know, later um, um, artists try to uh, illustrate uh, the story or, you know, in, uh, uh, the transcribe uh, the palindrome. And this each square was the uh, one reading of the palindrome. Yeah, some are so long, like 20 some meters. <laughs> Continue. All right. So this uh, medieval, I call pal uh, the pa uh, paradigm, temple building, more monumental scale. To the uh, 11th, 13th century, uh, the Song Dynasty start to you know, uh, uh, have a shift. So uh, the shift we can uh, still see in 11th century. The, the first um, female uh, regent after Empress Wu of the medieval time is called Empress Liu. This is her official portrait. And um, she, the way she involved in the uh, art, you can see, you know, kind of in between. On one hand, uh, she kind of inherited this medieval paradigm. So, uh, and then also, you know, uh, adapt more kind of refined uh, uh, literary art in uh, calligraphy and painting. So the case I um, have written about in my uh, book is about a site called uh, Jin Chi Jin Shrine. And the main building in the Jin Shrine is called the Sage Mother Hall. And the, it's, it's a site, uh, kind of has a spoiling, you know, uh, kind of garden-like. But it's also the site has a three uh, uh, spring, the source of water converge, and also encircled by the mountain. Very beautiful. So, you know, Chinese are really very feng shui. So this is a site to founder of the two dynasty, Tang and Song, uh, Tang in 6th to 9th century, uh, Song, 11th, 13th century. Poor Kren, this is a site, you know, it's a sacred site, and charged with, you know, all this uh, sacred meaning. So it was a place that being, you know, the state worship being conducted. So uh, the, the, the primary deity, the object of worship, was, you know, the dynasty founder. But around uh, 1130s, the main object of worship mysteriously changed into a female deity, <laughs> into sage mother. And this is under the regency of Empress, Empress Dowager Liu. Uh, the story behind her assuming the regency was pretty compelling. Actually, there are, you know, one after the other, the coup against her. And this is all Confucian scholar, you know, they were so worried that uh, a female uh, um, um, regent will repeat the story of Empress Wu of the Tang Dynasty. Right, so, but then later she succeeded. And after her, within 280 years of the Song Dynasty, there were 11 female regents. <laughs> so the, the, the story can continue. So it's interesting, I mean, Chinese, uh, the law, legally, women do not have the official right, uh, but they have the actual right, uh, power, uh, under the name of the filial piety, because they are the mother of the, the heir, right, uh, the succeeding uh, son. So when uh, it's purely based on the necessity and expediency, um, because Chinese have to keep this lineage, right? Only the older son can succeed the son. So when the emperor was young, five years old, um, seven years old, he need, uh, you know, uh, a regent. So instead of appointed regent, a high official, you know, in, within the Confucian construct, it's still much preferred the mother, right? So that's what the women's role uh, play, and then, you know, entering into the uh, political arena. Right. So um, they are, you know, related because the um, the post Wu Empress Wu era. So she has to be very careful. And uh, the the portraits 
this actually also tell us a lot about this woman. Um, next one, I see whether I have a full uh, portrait of her. The, okay, here. It's already a very kind of three quarter, right? Very um, kind of formal. But her portrait is unusual because she, um, she has this gauze on her face. And then the crown, you can count it, you know, 18 uh, female deity and the central one uh, riding the dragon. So altogether, 36. So this is everything, you know, is very significant. And this gauze, she even painted her um, lips into black color. You know, she's adopting a kind of um, very alluring makeup uh, of uh, the Tang Dynasty. And the way that she hold, uh, held her hand with one thumb up, this is one Chinese gentleman's, uh, you know, a right to greet each other, but not for men, for women. <laughs> so it just tell you a lot about the personality. Even that, that's what I try to say, um, um, the, uh, explain how Chinese women, you know, adapt into this Confucian construct. From the facade, look, they behave perfectly normal, right? Uh, 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 appropriate. But when you zoom in, you know, you see a lot of subtlety in how they, you know, uh, you know express themselves or reveal themselves. So the change of the uh, main subject of the worship, that's Empress Liu's the doing and how she did it. She created, you know, a 42 kind of uh, attendant around the main subject of worship, the sage mother. And, and, you know, and enshrined in the so-called Sage Mother Hall with all the dragon. The Sage Mother Hall, the location, was a really sacred location of this Hall Jin Shrine, because that's exactly underneath was the three spring converged. Okay. Next one. Let me show you. And what's course, and then what's the axis? Uh, continue. So we don't have time for this, okay. So the most ingenious part is the sculpture program. The sage mother was surrounded by 42 attendants. These are all the, you know, the female official or just you know, the, um, the regular uh, um, attendants. For, you know, they all have a different position. But among the 42, there are six uh, eunuchs. Right? And, uh, and among the female attendants, also some cross-dress uh, as a men's attire. So this is probably the early evidence that we have that eunuchs is being you know, portrayed as a sculpture. These are all slightly bit larger than the life size. And they are all extremely realistic, as if they can come alive you know, any minutes. Whereas the sage mother looks you know, very posed and very formal, right? very generic. So she actually is hiding herself behind the sage mother. Right? Because, and again, this is indirect practice. She would not put herself right in the facade. But being surrounded by, you know, this attendant looks so lifelike. So anybody entering into Sage Mother Hall immediately was, you know, old and feel that everybody come in the same, like an empress, you know, in her inner court. So uh, this empress views are doing. Next one, please. See? Very like they all have a you know different uh, personality from the sculpture. Mm -hmm. Review that, and this is a very high you know uh, uh, the um, uh, female uh, official holding the uh, the seal of the sage mother, and that's uh, uh, the portrait of one of the eunuchs. So again, very subtly review the Chinese uh, you know description of eunuchs. They usually have a um, high pitch voice, right? And they usually have finer skin, uh, have feminine look, <laughs> but they are all very cultured. So um, that sculpture, you know, is also say a lot. That's a sage mother home. A sage mother. Let's continue. Oh, different uh, you know, sculpture. Okay. And. Um, I also try to discuss who is Sage Mother. You know, the um, Chinese, uh, the powerful empress, were often actually uh, being addressed uh, by the, uh, uh, her subject as the Sage Mother. 
And sage mother is also a um, uh, Taoist uh, female deity. Uh, so it's kind of overlap, you know, with the... So these are all the images of female Taoist uh, deity or the uh, Mercury, you know, in charge of the north, the water, and also in charge of astrology and history, mm -hmm. uh, the art of writing. So you can see it's overlapped with, you know, both Buddhist, Taoist, indigenous Taoist practice, and other folk lords as well. So uh, of course she might have, you know, the religious, you know, advisor. <laughs> so from um, that time on, uh, 1100, the practice kind of had the shift and gradually, you know, um, uh, moved toward the fine arts. Uh, the art of writing, calligraphy, and painting. Uh, various roles, uh, they can be the creator, collaborator, they can be the collector. And often, you know, collector, not necessarily for the sake for themselves. Usually it's a way to, you know, uh, create image, public image, or to promote themselves. So like uh, the case of Empress uh, Dowager Chao, herself also a calligrapher, but she collect, you know, the gentleman's art, landscape painting. Not for her son. She also ruled as a regent for her grandson to show you know, her love to the grandson. And, uh, uh, and the story is very telling how she's gone all the ways, including the grandson's favorite is a uh, landscape painter called Li Cheng. So she, uh, but Li Cheng's painting is very hard to attend. So after she collected, she had the Li Cheng's granddaughter into the inner you know, uh, palace to authenticate the painting for her before she presented to the grandson. <laughs> Next one. Okay, and traces of uh, women or uh, the Chinese value, you know, even straight greatly uh, um, women's virtue. But women's talents has always been celebrated. But as long as the women don't transgress, you know, to a degree, or not to make too much of a public, you know, um, uh, display. So the, a lot of art were created like this. You know, these are all the core production uh, throughout the 13th century. It looked like it's just a beautiful painting, a depiction of a beautiful you know, lady, a uh, core lady. But from the core, it's all in this very subtle white attire you know, and her makeup and everything. Even though this is a, you know, a display of somebody has a good taste. Right? And then you look more carefully. What surrounded her? A screen. Do not, does not even have any painting, just you know, a, a plain screen, right? In the garden setting, and she was surrounded by arrays of cultural objects, uh, collection of art and writing objects, you know, not just uh, cosmetic stuff. Right? And of course, it's a loo to, you know, this is an example. It's a corals, you know, stack of books, right? And antiquities. So these are all the signs of women's uh, uh, talent actually being celebrated. In collection, uh, that's another big topic. I don't think <laughs> I would like to go. You know, probably uh, one example about didactic art, and then one about self-expression. See, the in Chinese painting, you see a lot of uh, seals, right? Called chops. Um, the seals. Any painting, you know, you read through the seals or the inscription, were able to reconstruct the biography of that single object. Because <coughs> Chinese collector, they put the seal on them. So uh, I tracked down several seals uh, belong to empresses of the you know, noble council. So being able to, to determine their taste and how the collection, what kind of role play, you know, in, uh, court politics as well as cultural you know, politics. Okay. And promoting didactic art in all different kind of ways. Sometimes they collaborate with a core painter. The painting was done, but you can see the core painter was very carefully yield the space mm -hmm. for the imperial hand. <laughs> yeah. So this is kind of you know from today we see it as a collaboration, right? But uh, back to them, the core painter mainly is just you know it's a very humble uh, um, position to serve the royal figure. So, and. 
in terms of collection of high art calligraphy, but also sometimes you know that very precious um, the um, um, the early art. I guess this is one of the most famous one called the um, the, um, the court uh, um, uh, what do you call uh, automation scroll uh, reviewing you know women's uh, the teaching for women and uh, was very well recorded. So a 12th century empress collected this uh, uh, piece. Uh, I was able to tell because of the collection seal. Uh, next one. She placed it right here between the emperor and, and, and a council. But the, the story goes on, you know, um, story after story. But this story happened to be about you know uh, one day emperor and the council uh, touring the imperial garden a bell got loose and was about to attack everybody was so scared you know other uh, court ladies everybody stepped back right to avoid the, uh, the bell there's one virtuous council not only did that you know step back she stepped forward uh, to you know ready to take the bullet for the emperor <laughs> So this is the story being celebrated. And uh, the Empress Wu who collected this painting, you know, was well recorded that she was not particularly beautiful, but it's because of her virtue. In particular, she's from a military family. And she often attended the emperor with, uh, you know, military attire. And also recorded that she actually saved the emperor uh, a couple of times. So again, she collected you know, a didactic painting and placed her personal collection seal right on the spot to highlight the story. So it's also you know, it's promoting herself. So just one of the examples. There are many, you know, collected the high art, the, uh, the real literary art, and those most celebrated. You see trace of the women too. So this is what I, I want to stress. It's about in Chinese cultural construct, you know, men and women are not completely separate at all. You know, they always kind of um, echoing each other. Uh, but the women has a different uh, practice, usually very indirect. So it's actually harder to discern. So these are all the seal of the uh, uh, collection seal of the same empresses. Uh, being able to track down a whole list of the high art that she collected, or promoting, you know, in the making of uh, court art in didactic uh, themes, and then you know she took special interest to transcribe some of these classic texts, like uh, um, um, the um, classic um, um, video piety uh, for women, and um, you know, basically it's about women's uh, teaching. Collect the uh, the most uh, treasures, seldom uh, created in the 11th century, the Ru Well, and many of it indicate you know, the uh, the location, uh, the uh, specific palace were being used, right? And they associate with a specific empress or a noble council. Collect books. So again, there's a lot of culture in there, culture and art. This one. Go. Continue. Right. So I think last example I would like to um, talk about is the art of expression. Um, these are many, many emperors by now. You probably get all confused, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Empress Yang, it's almost the, uh, the very end of the so called Song Dynasty. Uh, of course, politically, she's extremely savvy. And to the degree that she's also the true genius. Um, using art to not only promote herself but also express herself. Now I mentioned the water is that kind of manifestation of the in right or the, the supreme feminine. So she actually have the core painter Ma Yuan of her time create a set of elbow leaves, just twelve different scenes of water. And the water, each one she inscribed a poetic title, and then have a specific recipient. The recipient was her, you know, nephew, and um, so not only she uses it to express herself, you know, it's basically the manifestation of herself, but also the nephew. There are two nephews. One is very, you know, um, kind of enlightened, 
and always uh, behave properly. The other is kind of more arrogant. So this, the, the water element, the recipient, is the arrogant one. So you will ask, isn't that strange? You know, he didn't reward the most you know, uh, enlightened one, more appropriate one. He gave it to the, she gave it to the uh, more uh, kind of arrogant one. And, but you know, so eventually you read into the philosophy, it was the what water represent is the yielding philosophy. One, you know, always self-effacing, you know, not to um, overly um, kind of display or showing off. And that's the Chinese teaching that will, you know, make one last forever. Uh, you know, it is about self-preservance. Mm -hmm. So um, the water, not you see herself, she also used it as a teaching to, you know, nephew of her family. So that's the, uh, the whole thing behind that. And then the other thing that when she was young, she's from you know, a very humble origin. And as a court entertainer, was nurtured by the previous you know, uh, emperor's uh, empress. The emperor, uh, empress kind of doted on her because she was very intelligent and very beautiful. So she was given to the young emperor. And so the way to the empress for her was a long journey. Is also you know her own intelligence and her um, talent in arts and in politics. So um, later she proved herself that you know this was uh, the true master in utilizing the court art. So the next one is an example I want to uh, talk about. It's a small album. It's about twenty-eight, no more than thirty centimeters square. And in Song Dynasty, they created all this kind of very intimate, you know, small um, um, format of painting. And open, they have poetic inscription. So uh, now this is the painting after what I have written. You know, everybody say this is probably the most um, erotic uh, painting in China. But do you feel erotic if you just look at it? <laughs> if you don't read the Chinese uh, uh, poetic line? Is apricot blossom, right? Just a branch of apricot blossom, and quite um, you know uh, faithfully um, depict the apricot blossom. But you might want to ask what else here. Some collection seal with my later collector, court painter, your uh, your servant Ma Yuan painted this, very humble, and in the very obscure, right? And you know, low position. That's also tell you a lot. Um, it's not until uh, 14th century, uh, Chinese artists more you know kind of assuming the uh, this uh, subjective role. Uh, in the early time, the court painter, you know, the uh, um, the they were just doing the service, even the most talented one. So it's again very different. So later, uh, the um, if you study Chinese literary painting, of course, you see a lot of self in it. But in the most skillful uh, painting by court uh, painter, you very hard to find you know the name of the uh, this uh, court painter. Right, so that's the court painter's name. And you might ask who wrote this, right? Who inscribed it? And that's her writing. We know it because it's a uh, Kun, uh, it's the earth, the hexagram. Uh, the hexagram. If the three straight line that represent the heaven, that's only emperor can use it. You know, a three broken line, that's a queen um, a hexagram, represent the earth, that's the empress. So that's her, also another seal, uh, you know, with her last name. So she has this uh, um, core painter's production. It might be, you know, I've done several versions, she picked up one, and most skillfully reserved the space. You know, the early one I show you, just half half right this one is a diagonal composition and with a branch of uh, apricot blossom and the branch get to the middle part spread open like open the arms right embrace the poetic line so what did it say receiving the wind she present her artful charm Moistened from the dew, she revealed her pink beauty. If you have studied Chinese uh, um, literature, wind and dew 
is very you know explicitly um, um, referring to um, the male favor. So this is you know win and deal. So the every cards you know complete review and charm right or swipes um, in the win and the deal. So again we have to think of the context. A small painting like this with uh, such alluring or you know provocative line. Who will be the audience? This is not meant to circulate, right? What's created by the Empress. And considering her background, and this was done, uh, I did a stylistic analysis uh, with her calligraphy, the, you know, the development of the style. So this is the early style, when she's still you know, working hard on the way to become an Empress. So this is probably done in her 20s, right? Will you read this as a love letter? The only possible recipient will be the emperor, right? So she's also showing up her talents and something very alluring, right? Try to win the emperor's heart. Yeah. Um, so I think among the Song empresses, Empress Yang probably is the most talented in terms of using art. So not only she became the empress, she also you know, uh, played the pivotal role in determining the, you know, the, uh, the next song. It was not her son by birth. Right? Uh, so she basically dictated the two reigns, you know, her husband's reign and the, you know, the succeeding emperor that she handpicked. 